Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is a very frustrating one that is incredibly difficult to listen to, but it's a case that went unsolved for 30 years and was just solved in this past year of 2020. There are so many injustices that happen in this case that it will just make your head explode, but I feel like it's still so important to talk about and for her story to be told. A lot of the information that I got for today's video came directly from the biological mother in a podcast that I listened to where she was interviewed. I also listened to one or two other podcasts that talked about the case, and then I gathered up all the information from different articles that I read to put this video together in the most understandable and digestible format that I could possibly do. So with all of that being said, let's just get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the solved murder of Andrea Bowman. Andrea Bowman was born under the name Alexis Miranda Badger on June 23rd, 1974 in New Orleans, Louisiana to her biological mother, Kathy Turkanian. When she was five months old, she was placed for adoption by her biological mother because Kathy was only 17 years old when she had her daughter and she was not ready for the responsibility of a child. So I want to start off with a bit of information about Kathy and how Andrea eventually went on to be placed in the home that she was placed in. Kathy was described as a wild child. She sort of did her own thing growing up and got into a lot of trouble, but really she was just the victim of circumstance. She had a very rough upbringing and she struggled to find her place in the world. By the time she was only 14 years old, she was already working as a bartender and then she went on to join a traveling circus. At this time, Kathy was emancipated from her mother and was totally independent doing her own thing. When she was 16 years old, she met a 19 year old boy and they had a whirlwind romance as some would say. However, she soon found herself pregnant. Of course, as many people did back in that time, she got married to this boy and had her baby who she named Alexis. The couple tried for a few months to make things work, but again, as it so commonly happens in teenage marriages, the two did not end up working out. So because of this, Kathy took her daughter and moved back in with her mother. Now, like I said, at the time that Kathy had Alexis, she was living in Louisiana, but then she went to Virginia when she was living with her mother for a while. But at this time, Kathy's mother really was not in a good place. She had four other children living with her, depending on her while she was actually suffering from breast cancer. So when Kathy went to her mother with this baby, Kathy's mother really wanted nothing to do with it. So really, it was Kathy's mom that decided that she really was not ready to have a baby. So then Kathy's mom went to a Catholic agency and talked to the people about Kathy and explained why she was not ready to have this baby. After this, the state found out about the situation and basically gave Kathy two options. She could either give her baby to the state or she could give her mother custody of Alexis. Kathy was not close to her mother whatsoever and the two had a very hostile relationship, so Kathy did not want to give her baby to her mother. So the church was basically saying, look, if you give us Alexis, we will place her in an amazing home with an amazing family who will give her an amazing life. And Kathy looked at her own childhood, which she said was the absolute worst possible, so she opted for the unknown, the possibility of hopefully giving up her child to a really good family who would give her the best life possible. So when she was five months old, she was adopted by Dennis and Brenda Bowman. Now, at this time, Dennis was in the Navy, which I will get more into in just a minute, but because of this, he happened to be in Virginia at the time, and he was also a part of this Catholic charity, so that's essentially how he knew about Alexis to go and then adopt her. After the adoption, she was renamed to Andrea Bowman, and then the family moved with her back to where they were originally from in Hamilton, Michigan. Now, like I said, in 1972, Dennis had joined the Navy, but he had actually Actually applied to be in the Navy twice. He was denied the first time, which was before he ended up adopting Andrea. He was then accepted into the Navy after he applied for the second time, which was after the adoption or during the adoption, I'm not exactly sure when, but he went to Virginia for two weeks during his time in the Navy. When he left the Navy, it was actually because he was dishonorably discharged, but of course, when he went home to Michigan, he told everyone that he was honorably discharged. 
Now, I'm not sure the exact details of why he was discharged or anything like that, but as we will see throughout this video, his behaviors and actions are far from honorable. Andrea was described as being a quiet, shy young girl who was just trying to find her place in life. However, as she was growing up, those at school around her noticed that there was just something off about her. She often showed up to school looking very troubled, but there was one particular time where she boarded the school bus and she appeared to have what looked like blood all over her hands. It looked like she had cuts all over her arms and hands and it looked like she was dripping blood. It was obvious that the blood belonged to her and were the result of whatever happened to have caused all of these cuts. So people around her at school started to wonder if everything was okay at home. So this is when we really get into what was actually going on in the family home. So the reason that it brought up the whole Navy thing was because apparently the reason he hadn't been accepted the first time is because he had a criminal record, yet somehow he was still able to adopt Andrea, so we don't really know how how that happened, but it's thought that he somehow got his record expunged and wiped clean. But then, in 1980, when Andrea was only six years old, Dennis was charged with attempted murder and sexual assault of a 19-year-old girl. According to court records, Dennis would often just ride his motorcycle around this wooded area and scope it out for different girls to prey on. Well, one night he spotted a 19-year-old girl riding her bicycle and he followed her into the woods. He followed her in and then told her to come into the woods with him or else he would shoot her. Of course, this girl was absolutely terrified, but she knew very well that if she went with him that he was going to try to rape and kill her. So instead, she ran out onto the road and then threw her bike in front of a truck that was passing by and then she was able to wave the truck down. Luckily, this driver picked her up and gave her a ride to the police station where she gave a description of the man who had just tried to kill her. Very quickly, police went out and found Dennis still on his motorcycle and when they pulled him over, he had a big knife in his hand. They brought the girl back to identify him by taking her in the back of a tinted police car so that she could look at him without him looking at her. And of course, the second she saw him, she positively identified him as the man who had just tried to kill her. So he went to court, but he only pled guilty to attempted sexual assault. He said that he just went there to try and have forced sexual relations with her. So the attempted murder charge was dropped and was only charged and sentenced for the attempted sexual assault and was sentenced to five to 10 years in prison, but he served less than five. So after being released, he went to a halfway home and then eventually rejoined the family at their home. I'm not exactly sure when that happened, but at this point, Andre was only 11 years old. Then after being released, Brenda became pregnant. So by the time Andrea went missing a few years later, the child was still only 18 months old. So they didn't really know anything of their older sister. So by November of 1988, Andrea was 14 years old. Old. One day at school, Andre had confided in a teacher that she was afraid of going home because her father was molesting her. So because of this, the school sent over a social worker to the home to check it out and see what was going on. However, when asked, Brenda and Dennis denied the accusation completely and just told them that she had recently found out that she was adopted and she was just very, very upset. She said that the only reason she was making these accusations was because she was just trying to do whatever she could to be rebellious and go against them. So despite his criminal background of pointing a gun at a 19 year old girl, saying that he was going to shoot her and then attempting to sexually assault her and serving five years for that, the social worker did not see any issue with this, so she sent Andrea back home to live with them. So it's assumed that neither the worker or anyone else involved in this case actually took the time to look into Dennis's background, and that's why nothing was done. So they just believed Dennis. Now, I don't know if he was just a really good liar um, or if this was just very lazy work. It was probably a combination of the three, but no one ever went back to look to see if there was any backing on these accusations and if they actually did take the time to look, they would have seen that he does have a record of the same type of behavior that he spent time in jail for, but it seems like everyone involved just failed her and was just lazy. That's, it's as simple as that. 
Shortly after this accusation was made and the family received the visit from the social worker, the Bowmans left their home and moved to a mobile home in a rural area of Legion County, Michigan, which looks to be about a half hour away from where they lived in Hamilton. It was about three months after the initial allegations of molestation that police received a phone call reporting Andrea missing. Now, on March 11th, 1989, Dennis Bowman had actually been the one who called police to make this report. When he called he essentially said that he had gotten home from work that day and then noticed that there was a hundred dollars of his money missing saying that Andrea stole it and then said that a bunch of Andrea's clothes were missing and that he hadn't seen Andrea that entire day. He told police that Andrea told him that she was going to go out and find her biological mother so right away she was just labeled as a runaway and that is how it stayed for many years. Now after the initial disappearance there were several reports of people who called in with sightings saying that they saw Andrea in in Holland, Michigan, which is about 30 minutes away from where she was last seen. However, none of these sightings were actually confirmed and no one could be sure if it truly was Andrea. But then it turns out that Brenda was actually the one who made all of these calls. She was the one who called police and reported several times with all of these different stories. One of the reports she made said that a friend had actually seen Andrea at a grocery store, but that now she had bleach blonde hair and that she was noticeably pregnant. But again, none of these sightings were ever confirmed and it was just a little bit strange that it was always Brenda herself calling in and reporting these sightings. But then after this, the case remained stagnant for many years. Police, of course, investigated the disappearance, but the entire time it was labeled as a runaway, so they did not utilize near all of the resources that they had access to. They had tried questioning Dennis about the entire thing, but his story was always changing until eventually he just stopped cooperating with police and stopped giving them any information whatsoever. I also want to note that immediately after the disappearance, the Bowmans moved away from the home that Andre was last seen at, and I want to remind that they had just moved that house shortly before she disappeared so they really only lived there for like three months before they decided to up and move again after Andrea was reported missing. Also, Dennis was asked to take a polygraph test and he denied it. Additionally, this is one of the saddest things I've ever seen, but when asked if she had an older sister, Andrea's little sister, who was only again 18 months at the time that Andrea was last seen, she completely denied having a sister. She said that she didn't have one. This makes me think that Dennis and Brenda made absolutely zero effort to keep Andrea's memory alive and honestly, probably they removed any evidence of her in the home whatsoever. It was very obvious that something was up with the Bowmans and they were not who they said they were. Now, in 1998, Dennis was working with this woman and grew sort of an obsession with her. He started stalking her and then he started breaking into her trailer, taking some personal items like lingerie and underwear and things like that. He then cut a slit into her blinds so that he could peep on her whenever he wanted. He did a lot of gross things things like that so that he could stalk her whenever he got the chance. At one point, he was actually caught in her trailer and the police were called and they confronted him and he had told them that he actually just broke into this trailer because he had to go to the bathroom really bad, so he broke into the trailer to try and use her toilet. Obviously, this seemed like a lie, so they went ahead and searched his car and home. When they did, they found all of the stuff that he had stolen in a duffel bag, including panties and lingerie, as well as two crowbars, binoculars, and a sawed-off shotgun. He was a convicted felon who was caught with an illegal shotgun, yet somehow this charge was dropped, and the only thing he was charged with was breaking and entering with intent to commit larceny, and he only served one year in jail and five years probation for this. Now, before the sentencing, he wrote a letter letter to the judge saying that he's a good man. He's the father of two daughters, one who was 25 and one who was 11, but he failed to mention that one of these daughters he claimed to have was missing and hadn't been seen in 10 years. He also had people from his Catholic church vouching for him saying that he was a good man and a family man and he needed to be home to take care of his children. He had so many friends around the community who showed up for him and made character statements without actually knowing Dennis well enough to know who he truly was deep down. So because of all this, he only served one year before being being released on five years of probation and then he had to go to a sex offender program and 
that's it. Now, the first real big event in Andrea's case was in 1999 when the body of a teenage girl was found in Racine County, Wisconsin. The body was examined and it belonged to a young girl and the medical examiner initially thought that she looked remarkably like Andrea. For the time being, the body was labeled as Racine County Jane Doe, which I'm sure many of you have heard before. So over the course of a few years following the discovery in the early 2000s, police got in contact with the Bowman family and asked them to try and find anything that could possibly have Andrea's DNA on it. But Andrea was adopted. Obviously, years after Andrea went missing, the DNA may not be usable anymore. It could have been cleaned or just naturally deteriorated. And of course, since this was over a decade ago, DNA technology was nowhere near where it is today. So they asked Dennis to write a letter of permission to the adoption agency in Virginia that they adopted Andrea through to try and get in contact with her biological mother. Now, mind you, at that point, they did not know who Andrea's biological mother was. So this was all dependent on Dennis writing this letter of permission to reach out to her since this was a closed adoption and technically they were not supposed to be in contact. The mother and the biological mother were not supposed to be able to be in contact and it's just a whole privacy thing that they have to get around. He was asked to write this letter in 2008 and it took police begging and pleading with him for two years before he finally wrote that letter. So at this point, detectives flew over to Virginia with this letter and they actually explained to the adoption agency that they believed that Dennis may actually be responsible for Andrea's disappearance. This was based on his history and behavior of stalking and violence violence with other women and just how he's acted throughout the entire investigation. Essentially, they had to convince the adoption agency to be willing to open up her files for this closed adoption and give them the name and address and phone number of the woman who handed over this baby so many years ago so that they could get her DNA. And of course, ultimately, the agency did reach out to Kathy and they said, please get into contact with us. We have huge news. Now, Kathy actually felt very hopeful when they initially reached out to her. She thought at this point that she was finally going to get to meet her daughter after so many years. However, she was just informed that there had been a detective that was trying to get in contact with her because her biological daughter went missing 20 years prior and they believed that her adopted father was involved. They said, we want your DNA in case her body is ever found and never mentioned the Racine Jane Doe, probably because they weren't exactly sure if this was her, so they probably didn't want to cause a panic in Kathy. So she went over to the police station where she lived in Massachusetts and handed over over her DNA. Now, rather than sending her DNA directly over to the police station in Racine County, they sent it to CODIS and it sat there for a few years before they realized that Kathy's DNA was missing and it was sent to the wrong place. So by that time, the girl's body had actually been buried, so they had to dig up her body and finally compare the DNA. However, it turns out the body was not a match to Andrea. It wasn't until November of 2019 when Racine County Jane Doe's body was finally identified identified as belonging to Peggy Lynn Johnson, who was 23 years old at the time of her murder. Now, I don't have time to fully discuss Peggy's case since I want to focus on the case at hand, but I do feel like all victims deserve their stories to be shared, and I know that the Racine County Jane Doe's case was pretty big for quite a while before it was solved, so my next video will be on Peggy Lynn Johnson, so make sure to go ahead and keep an eye out for that video next week. But either way, after submitting her DNA and waiting for for so many years. Kathy was opened up to the entire situation of what her daughter had been through. She immediately started to research Dennis Bowman and everything that he was involved with, and to say that she was absolutely disturbed is an understatement. She was devastated. She found out about all of the horrible things that Dennis had done to so many other women, and she could not figure out how this horrible, horrible man was allowed to adopt a child. At this point, after the initial mourning and grief had passed, she hired a private detective to get to the bottom of what happened to her biological daughter. So now let's switch gears just a little bit and discuss another murder that helped solve what happened to Andrea Bowman. So for this, we have to jump back in time quite a bit, so it might be a little bit confusing, but just bear with me. 
Now let's talk about the murder of 25-year-old Kathleen Doyle. In early 1980, Kathleen O'Brien was 25 years old when she married a Navy pilot, Stephen Doyle. They were living in Northfolk, Virginia, and they were married for only five months before Stephen was shipped off for duty on the USS Eisenhower. Now she was used to this because again, she was a military wife and as a military spouse, you have to expect that your spouse is going to be gone for months at a time. So she was comfortable living in her small home home alone with her orange tabby cat, Ike. The house that she lived on was on Granby Road and the area that she lived in seemed very safe because there was not a lot of crimes, but just before she was murdered, there was another murder of another army wife just a few weeks before. So even at this point, a lot of people were on edge and when Kathleen was murdered, and I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but they thought that it was connected to the first murder, but as we will see, it was not. Now, in September of 1980, Kathleen's friends noticed that they hadn't seen her in quite some time and hadn't heard from her either. So they went ahead and went to her home to go and check in on her. But what they saw when they got there was absolutely horrific. They found Kathleen laying there in her home, dead in her bedroom. Her body was bound and gagged and was absolutely horrible condition and the bedroom had appeared to have been ransacked. After her body was examined, it came back that she had been strangled with a cord, she had multiple stab wounds all over her body, and she had been brutally raped. She was horrifically and violently murdered. They determined that by the time her body was found, it was most likely that she had been dead for at least 24 hours at that point. However, very quickly, her case went cold. There was absolutely no evidence anywhere that pointed them in any sort of direction. This was until 90 1984 when another man named Henry Lee Lucas actually confessed to the murder. Now, Henry Lee Lucas was already on death row in Texas after murdering his own mother. One day, he sat down with investigators and gave them a massive list of all of the women that he had killed, and among the hundreds of names was Kathleen Doyle. So, of course, they reached out to the Northfolk Police Department who flew out to Texas to interview him and collected evidence. They actually found some things that could connect him and his partner Otis to the crime scene, so they were ready to charge them both with murder. But just as quickly as he confessed, he recanted. He pretty much told police that he had made the entire thing up. He literally said to police that he did this because he just wanted to make them look like idiots. So of course, after this, her case went cold once again. They had DNA and other leads in the case, but again, this was the 80s and DNA technology just wasn't where it's at today. So, this case remained cold until 2018 when that DNA actually found a match. So using DNA found on Kathleen's bed sheets, Northfolk police took the DNA to a genealogy lab and put together a family gene pool. Turns out Kathleen's murderer appeared to be from Michigan. So Northfolk police department reached out to Michigan to run the DNA and lo and behold, they found an exact match. After 40 years of absolutely no answers, police found out that the man who had killed Kathleen Doyle was none other than Dennis Bowman. In November of 2019, Northfolk police flew to Michigan to apprehend now a 70-year-old Dennis Bowman and bring him back to Virginia to charge him with the murder. It didn't take long before Dennis confessed to Kathleen's murder and spelled out exactly how it happened. So 40 years prior, 31-year-old Dennis had gotten drunk and broke into to Kathleen's house through her bedroom window. He told police that he initially just went there to steal. However, when he spotted Kathleen, he made the snap decision to sexually assault, stab, and beat her. But he told police that when he left that night, Kathleen was still alive and breathing. Now, initially, police were confused as to how this random man from Michigan was on a military base in Norfolk. Now, this was after he had adopted Andrea, so it seemed like he had made two different trips to Virginia during his time in the Navy. Then, police made the connection they soon realized that this man also had a daughter who was missing. So of course, they started looking into the disappearance. 
Now, this was decades after she went missing, so it was going to be difficult to figure out exactly where to start. However, thankfully, it turns out her biological mother, Kathy, had been investigating her daughter's disappearance for a decade. She had her own private investigator and had been working very closely with Michigan police this entire time. So when Dennis's DNA was connected to Kathleen, they immediately questioned him about his adopted daughter. While he was awaiting his trial for the murder of Kathleen Doyle in February of 2020, he confessed to accidentally murdering Andrea. He said that one night, him and 14-year-old Andrea had gone into a very heated argument. So he hit Andrea and she had fallen backwards and fell down the stairs and broke her neck. So of course, after hearing this confession, police went and searched for Andrea's body. A few days after the confession, skeletal remains were found on the 3200 block of 116th Avenue in Montgomery Township in Allegiant County in the backyard of Dennis Bowman's house. The remains were found in a shallow grave and had been covered up with a thin layer of cement. These remains were compared to the DNA that Kathy had provided, and of course, the remains were matched to Andrea Bowman over 30 years after she went missing. By May of this year, Dennis was arrested and charged with open murder, felony murder, first-degree child abuse, and mutilation of a body related to the death of his adopted daughter, Andrea Michelle Bowman. He is now awaiting his trial, facing life in prison. Of course, Kathy is absolutely devastated and frustrated in the fact that her daughter was given to such a violent man with such an extensive criminal history. I have no idea how someone like this can just slip through the cracks like this and adopt a child when they have a violent criminal history, or even keep his child after all of these horrific run-ins with the law. And even further, somehow throughout the entirety of the investigation, investigation. She was just considered a runaway, despite her adoptive father being involved in multiple cases of stalking, sexual assault, and attempted murder. I can't even imagine the guilt that Kathy must have felt for all of this. It definitely, obviously, was not her fault, but imagine giving a child up thinking that she will be given the best possible life because you just can't take care of her anymore, only to find out that the family she was given to abused her the entire time and then murdered her. I can't even imagine. As for Brenda Bowman, I don't believe she is being charged with anything, but her involvement is questionable. Kathleen definitely believes that she's involved, or at the very least, knows exactly what happened and knew about the abuse the entire time. She stood by her husband throughout this entire thing, and I believe they're even still married as he's sitting in jail. I would like to see if there are any charges against her, because even if she didn't touch Andrea once, she is still an accessory to child abuse and murder. There is no way she didn't know about all of this. I would like to see her try and deny knowing anything when she literally sat there and made police reports saying that her friends saw Andrea in all of these different places. It was obvious that she was just calling to throw police off of their tail. And that in and of itself proves to me that she knew exactly what happened and was helping her husband cover everything up. So to me, that is very deserving of a charge at least to accessory to murder. I don't even know what kind of mother can sit through and watch Andrea go through everything that she went through and then sit idly by as it happens. She did nothing to stop it. She had every opportunity to turn her husband in before and after the murder or even get a divorce after finding out all the horrific crimes that he did, like trying to kill this 19 year old girl just to try and keep her own children safe. It could have even been prevented by her doing that and taking the kids with her, but she didn't do absolutely anything. And again, in my opinion, she is just as guilty as Dennis's for what happened to Andrea. This is just such an unbelievable case and it breaks my heart into a million little pieces. She had it rough from the very beginning and it's just so, so, so heartbreaking that she confided in a teacher that she was being molested in her home and then it was just chalked up to her being upset about finding out about being adopted. I don't know about you, but this excuse does not make even a bit of sense, even if it was true. Most children in a stable home don't just go and accuse 
accuse their parents of molesting them. I definitely could see how she would be upset finding out that she's adopted, but most kids in this situation would act out simply by trying to find their birth parents instead of, you know, going out and saying that they're adoptive parents are molesting them and this is coming from someone who is not adopted so i have absolutely no idea how it feels finding out all of this information so if you have been adopted or know someone who's been adopted please um give us your thoughts in the comments on what i'm about to say but to me finding out you're adopted if you have a good home life i feel like you would be very upset and you might even try to find your adoptive parents but you would at least appreciate that I still have good parents. They still take care of me and I'm not going to do something to go out of my way to get them arrested or put in jail. Like I just don't see how someone would go through that mindset and try to get their parents in trouble. This is assuming if this kid has a very good stable home life again. I could see this kid going out and acting out by trying drugs or starting to party or joining the wrong crowd and just trying to be rebellious in so many different ways but i just don't see someone who has a stable home life being so upset that they tell their teacher that their dad is molesting them i just don't see how that makes any sense to anyone around Andrea or anyone else who would say something like that. Even beyond what I'm just saying, even if there is a kid who lies about being molested and it turns out they're not being molested, there's most likely something, at least something going on in the home. Even if it's not molestation, something's going on in the home to make that kid in a mindset where they feel like they have to say that to get someone's attention. Again, even if someone's lying about this, it's probably to get the attention of an adult to make them notice something that's going on at the very least. So the fact that they literally just brushed this up to her being upset about being adopted is just mind blowing to me. And it just feels so lazy. Cases like this just make me so incredibly angry at everyone, the teachers and the schools for seeing her showing up looking neglected and abused and just not right. And then listening to this young girl confiding in their teacher about abuse and then just ignoring it. For the social workers believing these parents, what do you think parents are going to do if you ask them if you're molesting your kid? You think they're just going to straight up admit it? No! they're gonna deny it. Every parent ever is going to deny it. No one wants everyone to know that they're molesting their child. I will never understand how this happens so many times where they straight up ask the parents, hey, are you abusing your kid? We see that your kid is bruised and bloody and, you know, they told us that you're raping them. Is this true? And then the parents just go, oh, of course not. My kids are just dirty little liars. And then the social workers think, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. Carry on. It's so freaking dangerous for the child. And most children who go and tell someone else about the abuse, if it gets back to the parents and nothing is done, the child is abused even more and is punished for telling. So the fact that this cycle happens so often is so infuriating. And I know that some people will say that this was back in the 80s and, you know, things have changed. No, it hasn't. This has not changed. The same exact situation happens today in 2020, 40 years later. It's absolutely ridiculous. Kathy believes that it's possible that the real reason that Dennis killed Andrea was because he may have raped her and then maybe she got pregnant and obviously he couldn't have that getting out. It's also very possible that she was killed simply for speaking out against him for making it known that he had been molesting her. To me, either of those things seem very, very likely, especially seeing as how she was killed right after that visit from the social worker, which is why, again, it is just so freaking frustrating that this still happens. So many times the people whose job it is to protect children from the people that are supposed to take care of them but are doing a piss poor job of it, um, sometimes they are directly responsible for putting these children's lives in danger. It's horrific and again, it needs to change. I could sit here and just rant for hours about how much injustice there is in this case, but you get the point. She didn't deserve any of this and she was failed for over 30 years by everybody except her biological mother 
all she ever did from the moment Alexis was born was try to ensure that she could give her the best possible life. And then after she found out what happened, she dedicated her life to figuring out exactly what happened to her daughter and to bring justice to her. But either way, that is pretty much all I have for today's case. And I would like to hear your guys' thoughts. What do you think is the real reason that Dennis killed his daughter? Do you think he's being honest about it being an accident? Do you think that Brenda deserves some charges against her. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Also, obviously, he is in jail awaiting trial. We pretty much know what happened, but if more information comes out about Andrea's case, as always, I will keep you guys updated, especially over on my Twitter. That is where I keep most up to date with any cases that I cover, especially these more recent ones. But either way, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to keep on the lookout for next week's video about Racine Jane Doe. And don't forget to turn those notifications on so that you can get notified whenever I come out with a new video. Also, don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to shoot me an email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. I read every single case suggestion that I get and pretty much every case that I cover on my channel is directly from that email. So again, please do not hesitate to send your suggestions over. With that, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!